<laughs> hey folks, I'm Dave with Small Batch Cigars Daily Bash, and today I'm talking to Nicholas Malio of Foundation Cigar Company. He's going to be talking to us in the tobacco barns and in his office, so stay tuned. Heart of the Connecticut River, the valley, you're here. Great to have you. This is awesome. What I was saying before about the double Corona, if this was filler, we'd strip it from about here. We're trying to get rid of this central, you know, this large vein. We call them frog strips, right? When you're making the double Corona, because it's so long, if I'm making a shorter cigar, I have to tear here and tear on the bottom and redistribute that tobacco. The double Corona is so long, it's using the whole strip straight through. So you're, you don't have to tear off of the top. See, if I was making my bunch, I'd tear here and then redistribute. So the double Corona, you're getting straight through. You're getting a nice, consistent blend out of any of the sizes with the double Corona a lot of the time. I would say talking? inconsistent, it's just you're making the blend, those blend, that's why every size is, has a little bit different sometimes because of that distribution of those tobaccos. That's why a lot of times when you say, oh, a cigar st starts off much stronger is because a lot of times they'll tear this and then put it in the foot of the cigar. So now you're smoking double of that. And then you get through the first third and it opens up because you might have more of Viso and Ligero just in the foot of the cigar. Or it could be vice versa. If they take the bottom parts, the bottom part of the leaf that's closer to the stem is a lot of times much more bitter. That's what we say generally. The tip is where your sweeter, your your tastier part of the leaf is. As you get closer to the stalk, it's going to get more bitter. If you think of like broccoli or you always cut this in, you're not smoking the part that's, you know, that's going to be much more bitter down the stalk. So you cut it closer to the, it's the same way with tobacco. But if certain manufacturers are taking the bottom off and then they're putting it in the foot, which some people, everybody has their own their own way, you're gonna have a cigar that starts off maybe milder or even more bitter at the foot. That's why cigars get real bitter at the end of time. You know some cigars, yeah. you can smoke them straight down and they don't get that bitter? It's because a lot of times you're taking the bottom part and they're putting it way down and it's an over and abundant and then it get by the time the heat builds up and the moisture builds up, it's, you know, it's too much. For me, I'm just saying, generally speaking, the double Corona with that long, consistent leaf, it makes for just, uh, in this blend, the Tabernacle or the, ta the Tab Havana Seed, we sell just as much double Coronas as we're selling Toros and Robustos. Damn. And it's, <laughs> it's because the, the flavor just keeps going, and it, keep, it keeps going right down to the band. They're packing, what I'm saying is the distribution, when they're breaking here and they're breaking here, for some reason the Cubans are freaking packing it right at that band all the time. And they're over packing at the band and they're not distributing it properly throughout the bunch. And you get tight cigars, especially if you start kinking the bunch when you're rolling it. And it's interesting that that technique, you know, they, they, someone hasn't corrected it completely, but it's a problem that I find consistently, and everybody kind of says consistently with Cuban cigars, that they're overpacking, you know, because of that distribution for some reason right in, right in the band. This is, this is all detailed, you know, more stuff that a lot of guys don't get into, but the tips are here, right? I already tore them off, but I'm tearing here and I'm distributing. What's happening in the Cubans is they're tearing here and then they're putting it all right there. You understand what I'm saying? They're, putting, they're not distributing it evenly. It's all being packed right there. So they take off the bottoms 
and they put it all right there. Damn it. It's not the greatest example because there's no, I don't have filler tobacco and this is all wrapper, but that's the tear port. That part is crucial. You know, it's long filler, but you have to redistribute that or you don't have to. A lot of times we'll take maybe the Seiko because it's too bitter out depending on the blend and not redistribute that. Depends on the blend. It de depends on what you're trying to accomplish with the blend. You know, because if you want some, if you want the cigar to t to evolve a little bit and change, then you will put a little bit more of that part at the tips, right towards the foot, or you'll distribute it out a little bit more. You know, that's when some people say that you know the blend evolved or it started off really strong, and then it rounded out, and then uh, you know evolved from there. This is a controlled environment as much as we can control it, right? You can see the flaps on the side of the, the barn so it's to let in, in you know, humidity so we can naturally cure this down to what I was saying before is we want this central vein structure to be about an 18% moisture content. So it can't be loaded with moisture, um, the whole vein system, otherwise the tobacco eventually is gonna start to rot if it's too wet. We know it's a good cure, See this? I look at that and I see glory. This is like sunshine on a rainy day because the vein is the last to dry out. You see that? So we're getting an even cure starting in between the vein system. And then this is the last to dry because this has the, mo the, the most moisture content. If it was curing opposite, right? and the vein was curing first and then out, it's not gonna cure evenly. You're not gonna get an even dish. And that's what we're trying to do here. This is what the most difficult part is for wrapper tobaccos, is to get a consistency in the cure. Otherwise, you, you, it's not gonna be wrapper tobacco. That's one of the most difficult things about growing wrapper tobacco is you're dealing with the elements. You see it's raining here today. We have more moisture content in the air. Is, you know, really, playing with is we're always balancing this to make it cure evenly so you don't have huge changes in coloration so for example if you if this leaf was exposed to extreme heat when it first started it would shock it green you know that's why sometimes you see green spots on certain tobacco you know you can have sections that got too much heat and now it's not going to change over because too much heat too quick we're trying to do it gradually over you know 70 75 days depending on the conditions that could that could change but this is this is what you want to see you know when you see we're towards the end you know end of this cure here but this leaf you know if we go in the center you'll see a little bit more but that's what we're looking for that's a beautiful beautiful sight A lot of guys say, you know, oh, these are young or oh, they need a little bit more time. Nah, no, all the stuff that I'm using is three plus years from the fillers to the wrappers, you know, old. What happens a lot of times is what I see is sometimes over fermentation, right? It's the difference between taking a can of pasta sauce, putting it in a pan, putting it on the oven and my grandmother's pasta sauce. Right? You're starting with, okay, fresh ingredients, but you are simmering at low heat for eight all day. Okay, why? Because once you turn up the heat, you start losing a lot of the good stuff, it start evaporating into the elements. If you let that boil and boil at such, a, eventually what would you have? Nothing, right? If you let that pot boil, boil, with this, eventually it's gonna evaporate until you're, you're down to nothing. That's the same thing with this leaf, right? If you keep fermenting and fermenting down, you destroy all of the cellular walls of this leaf and it will disintegrate, right? Before it will just disintegrate, you know, fall apart, okay? How do we maintain the oil and the flavor so we keep all the, you know, look at this leaf. If you look at the Tabernacle 142s or the Brawley, oil, life. You know, it's got tooth. It's got, you know, I say those are flavor pockets. That's how do we preserve that at the same time, cure it, time, know-how, 
commitment to quality and the leaf, you know, and the flavor. That's why, you know, that's what I think makes foundation different is that you can taste it in the blends and then the blending is the other side of things. You can put me in a kitchen with the best ingredients. I'll make something all right because I have the best ingredients. But if you put, a, you know, somebody that really knows food and knows flavors and ingredients, it's going to be a whole different experience. Good Lord. That's a tough question. I was just talking about that with uh, Rob, my coworker, of just being able to put it all down what an average day is. There's no average days, you know. Um, there's a lot going on constantly. So when I'm here, you know, during this time, a lot of times I'm looking at tobacco, right? Um, so I'm up at the fields looking at, you know, the crops as we saw today. Um, so tomorrow I'll be at the fields all day. So this time is kind of crucial from, you know, end of August, September, October into November because here in the valley is the is harvest time and when the crops are coming up. So a lot of times you find me in the fields and then here in the office working with the team here, um, you know, making sure we got product coming in. Like today we were receiving shipments. So. We got shipments clearing through customs. We have a lot of product that's back ordered. So we're trying to clear things as quickly as possible through customs so then we can get, you know, product out to people that have been waiting on kind of back ordered, pro you know, shipments. Um, you know, managing, you know, all the non-glamorous kind of things in the background, packaging material, ordering. Um, you know, I'm very much involved in that. As you know, we started, we're small, company so a lot of the packaging material production planning all of that I'm, I'm handling day in and day out that's my experience for the past 16 years has been on that side of things so now I'm balancing you know both worlds um, so there's a lot more on my plate because I'm exposed now to the whole this whole other part of the industry which is sales and distribution at the same time I'm managing you know, tobacco purchasing, production planning, packaging, um, and at the same time, managing taxes, you know, dealing with state of California. Guys see me, tobacco pilones, fermentation piles, and oh, what a life. There's nothing more stressful than, you know, working with tobacco because it's susceptible to the elements and you can't control those elements a lot of times, so. Yeah. That's happening all the time. I mean, you see what the ceremony that, that took place today? We, that's not a fake thing. You know, every time I open up a box, it's to me a ceremony and I'm always checking. That's why a lot of times guys ask me what other brands, you know, do you like? And, and the honest answer is I don't get enough time to smoke other people's brands to really get a sense of what, what they're about is because I'm always quality control checking. I'm always, I'm a cigar smoker. You know, that's, I know the experience of being a cigar smoker. I want that experience to be perfect every time. I know what it's like to get a cigar and, you know, not draw properly or the blend not being right. So I do everything in, in my power to make sure the quality and consistency is on point. So that it's, it's happening all the time. To quantify it would be difficult. Um, to me, it's just an ongoing process that's when I'm in the stores, I'm checking product. When I'm down in Nicaragua, I'm checking product. You have to do it that way because every day is a new day on the production floor. You know, I, I come from, you know, managing, you know, an operation that was up to 105,000 cigars a day. And we ran, you know, maybe a 2% rejection rate, which is, you know, it's, it's incredible because you have, you're holding the line, you know, in order to maintain quality, you have to, you know, hold the line and always keep that, that line, you know, saying tabernacle, the uh, tabernacle broadly, if we were out for almost two months, tobacco wasn't ready, you know, is it, could you, you know, put them in boxes and ship them up and, get, but I, you know, I know what that leads to and I, I always have to stay true to the product, so 
it's a representation of who I am and who the company is. So as long as I'm around, it causes a lot, you know, it's a lot because it's, it's a lot, it's a lot to manage and you, you know, they're like your kids, you know, I was saying before, I don't, I don't have kids. I'm not married. Don't have a, this is, this is, this is my kids. So I'm always diligent to make sure everything's on point. I mean, seed, you know, seed development is always the innovative step, right? Is, is working with different seed varieties. We're working with a lot of different seed varieties in the valley. Um, we talked about it before of what innovation, sleeping on innovation ends up, you know, you end up losing the market if you're not on top of the game. So, you know, here in the valley, as we talked before, Connecticut Shade, you know, at one time there was you know, tens of thousands of acres of Connecticut shade being grown in the valley. Ecuador took a lot of that. Um, I'm trying to encourage that amongst farmers here in the valley is to stay innovative. So we're working on a lot of things, you know, behind the scenes as far as innovative seed varieties. Um, I think the Tabernacle 142, I mean, it's just a in incredible, incredible seed variety that has sort of been developed over the years. Um, which is kind of innovative. Um, our infused product, I think, is is innovative. It's a good balance between infusion and the actual tobacco, tobacco blends. Um, I'd like to think that you know what makes us attractive is the blends. You know, I f I just love cigars. I feel like I have a good hand on the pulse of what the cigar market, especially in the states, is looking for. And that could be from stronger to milder to medium. But um, I'm really trying to captivate as all that flavor, as much flavor as possible, body strength without it being overwhelming on the palate. Hence our conversation before, you know, that's it. You know, I don't know if that, that means innovative. I mean, just being here in the Valley, I think, I, I think we're the only cigar company that has a, our office actually on a tobacco field. Uh, that was, you know, kind of the, the vision from the beginning, being from Connecticut. You know, you mentioned it before, from a tax standpoint, business perspective, it would be much easier if I had everything in Florida. It's much closer to Nicaragua. You know, for me, Connecticut Valley is a very important part of my journey, uh, foundation as a company. So, um, you know, I think that's definitely part of our innovation and you know, really trying to honor what I try to do is honor the, you know, the history, the culture of the past and, you know, give it our own, you know, modern day touch of things that have really influenced my, my life. I actually smoked one about two weeks ago. So it was rock steady in, in one of the stores and um, I smoked a, a Zola which is a six by 52 Connecticut broadleaf. So that one, we actually, we're just getting a shipment cleared tomorrow because we've been sold out of those. Those have been selling quick. It's interesting to see what happens in the market and what people kind of gravitate to. And I think a lot of people have picked up, you know, that that size particularly is Connecticut broadleaf, which a lot of people didn't realize. So you're getting, you know, the broadleaf, you're getting a good combination between you know, the infusion and the cigar. Again, it's not my cup of tea, right? It never was my cup of tea, the infused market, but working in a, I started working in a shop in 96. Everybody, you get all different walks of life that are coming through the door. And not everybody is gonna be able to smoke a tabernacle. This is what determines sometimes whether cigar smokers continue to be cigar smokers or not sometimes is getting the right product for every customer that walks through that door. Certain people are smoking one to two cigars a month. Maybe not, maybe here and there. They, these are the majority of the smokers though. They outweigh, you know, the people that potentially are watching this video right now or, or your audience or my main audience a lot, of, a lot of times. But like I said before, if I, I wanted to offer a portfolio of brands and blends and price points for all the different consumers coming in in that door. And if you're, a, you know, a tobacconist, a cigar shop owner, you understand that more. 
because you know you get all different types of people that are walking through that door. So what are you gonna do? Send them down the street, send them to another, or are you gonna have an offering you know, that you believe in and that you know is good quality and it's gonna continue to have that you know, consumer smoke and then maybe they're gonna get into the tabernacle. Maybe they're gonna get into a Wawensei. And I think that's what happens with, you know, that infusion allows that. Because a lot of people that are not used to tobacco, it, it, it's too much. Especially if you give them the wrong cigar when they first come in. I mean, imagine you get someone that comes in the store, never smoked before, and you give them a tabernacle. It's probably not going to, it's too much. It's not the right, it's not the right blend for, for, for that palate. And they might not never come back because that's what they think all cigars are. Personally, the brand is goes hand in hand with my whole career in the industry and my love for cigars. Because in '96, people don't realize all of some of the some of the greatest cigars at that time in '96 were being made in Kingston, Jamaica. Macanudo Hyde Park came without cellophane when that cigar first came out. Connecticut Shade from the Valley. They use San Andreas Mexican Binder, Jamaican, Dominican, and a little bit of Nicaraguan filler. For a little bit of body and you know a little bit of flavor. Cigar was phenomenal. Royal Jamaica, phenomenal. Temple Hall, phenomenal. The same time I started smoking cigars, I fell in love with what we call roots reggae. Reggae music coming from Jamaica. We're talking late 60s, early 70s. Bob Marley, of course. But um, a lot of these, the end of the 60s in Jamaica, everybody was obsessed with uh, Italian spaghetti westerns. So you see a lot of the album art covers had this depiction of the good, the bad, and the upsetters. They were all album covers that were kind of paying homage to the love for these spaghetti westerns and a lot of them had cigars in their mouth. So hence the image of the upsetters is that it, it's actually a play on an old Jamaican cult classic movie called The Harder They Come with Jimmy Cliff. Um, but a lot of it is based on, you know, the upsetter, the underdog, you know, the one that comes to, come to town in the spaghetti westerns. He wasn't really good, but he wasn't bad. And, you know, he sort of has to defend, defend against, you know, all the injustices that are going on. So, to make a brand, to sort of pay tribute to all, you know, this culture that I've been, you know, listening and admiring to since 96, you know, just, it just seemed to work for me and the upsetters. I think you could taste and you could definitely feel nicotine, right? That's what we're, we, we smoke, what's used for cigar black tobaccos. Nicotinum uh, rustica, I mean uh, tobacco. Nicotina rustica is what they said grew more indigenously wildly here in the Americas. Those le the rustica plant, the leaves are much smaller and the nicotine content is like eight to 10%. We're, we're at like 2%. I've only smoked it a couple times, Rustica. I almost fell down. So the, uh, the, the, the potency of the nicotine. You know, I've dipped tobacco for a while. You know, when you haven't dipped tobacco and you feel that nicotine rush sometimes, that's like nothing on what the Rustica plan is. So what we're smoking is in that 2 to 3% range, as far as I understand it, right? Sometimes when you get that in the back of the throat, it can be just, again, the blends, right? The blends determine how much, sometimes that's just straight strength. If you're stroke, you know, smoking Ligeros, Vizos, and you, the blend is, you know, over dominating, then you're gonna get that on the back of the throat. If you're getting tobacco that's raw, that's not been cured and fermented, you're gonna get that. You know, it's going to hit you sharp, but it's not always necessarily, you know, if you're getting at that, it's young tobacco or it's not fermented tobacco. It could be just the, the strength of the blend. I think uh, it was Dion from Illusion was explaining it that way. It's, 
you know, that's coming in sharp and it's hitting you, you're trying to get that full palate stimulation, right? I'm trying to stimulate all of the palate without getting that harshness, get that body, get the strength. A lot of people talk about it, but that's the, how do you get that, the body, the strength, and all that flavor without it being jading your palate, overwhelming your palate. A lot of that has to do with the blending. So I'll tell you, I mean, my experience is not as much with Pennsylvania Broadleaf. So I always, I always say, you know, I know what I know based on experience. That's the only reason why I know what I know. So it's, you know, day in, a lot of guys say, how do you, how do you learn how to blend? I want to learn tobacco. And they, you got to move to Nicaragua. You got to move to Honduras and you got to work with it day in, day out. From my experience with Pennsylvania, um, you know, you have different, completely different growing conditions, similar seeds that were brought to Connecticut. You don't have the Connecticut River Valley. So, you know, we were seeing on the map before is this 30,000 acres in this valley left this really unique sandy loom soil, right? So this sandy loom soil is about this thick, right? Your clay is about here. So what happens is, is the water is trying to find the lowest point, of course, because there's so much sandy loom, it's able to filter through and go deep down to that bottom part of the clay. What do the roots want to do? They want to find water. So the root system is able to go down deep before it attaches to that. In Pennsylvania, I believe you have more of that clay. So you're going to get bigger tobacco. That's going to result in bigger leaves. Okay. A lot of the times the soil there to me, the Pennsylvania is a bit more rustic on the palate. Whereas that Connecticut broadleaf, you just have that, this natural sweetness this natural earthiness. Not to say Pennsylvania is bad, right? I always say this a lot of times because I don't necessarily believe that something's better, you know, or worse necessarily. Everything has its own characteristic that can be useful in the blending process, right? What makes something better or worse is your sorting, selecting, your growing practices, your fermentation, you know, all of that determines whether something's better or worse as far as quality of, of crops, um, if that makes sense. But to me, it's it's definitely more rustic to Pennsylvania. Um, you don't have as much as that sweet earthiness that you're getting from the broadleaf from Connecticut. What is a blaring signal that you have something that is not fermented or young would be bubbling of the wrapper, black bubbling, which sometimes can then turn into blues or purples almost. Okay. That is right there. You can tell that that's a sign of tobacco that has not been fermented properly. That's an extreme degree on the scale, right? Some tobaccos, depending on what they are, will have more of a thicker, darker burn line. Not that's not doesn't necessarily mean it's not fermented properly. As long as you're not getting extreme bubbling, it's staying consistent. Um, you know, sometimes in some of the you know the broadleaf, we're using a lot of heavy fillers, right? If you're using heavier visos ligeros in the fillers, then we're using a San Andreas Mexican binder, heavier tobacco, broadleaf wrapper, heavier veiner, veiner tobacco. That cigar is going to go out quick. You're not going to have, you know, it's not going to keep burning. Like it's going to, I see sometimes, you know, go, oh, it didn't burn. I had to relight it. I mean, it's not, is that, if that's a huge inconvenience, what, what if the flavor is on, and the flavor is there and it's not bitter and it's not too sharp and it's then that's ne not necessarily that something's you know not fermented properly it's the nature of the tobacco it's heavier leaf you know you take the tabernacle 142 cuban seed the lancero that's sometimes you're going to get some heavier wrapper leaf because of the diameter of the ring it's a 40 ring gauge that's going to have maybe a thicker burn line sometimes right? Because you don't have as much filler in the diameter to help everything along. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. um, so I'm looking for, for that consistency of the burn, 
the burn line, um, and then of course, you know, the flavor uh, of what's coming out. Of course, the ash, you know, how it's burning. Sometimes, you know, people say it needs to be a white ash or it's not. I, you know, I, again, I'm not a botanist or a scientist, so I can't, I wish I could explain it down to the science of it. But from what I've noticed through experience, that is not, uh, you know, always a bad sign. It's just not the case. Oh man. <laughs> That's old school Connecticut style. The old school Connecticut guys, they don't even light them anymore. They just chew them and cut them, chew them and cut them. You know, I have to say, I've heard different, um, different explanations on this that actually, you know, saliva could actually dry out the cigar more, which was the first time I heard that from somebody and I don't know the sense. I tend to do it from, from time to time time to time depending on maybe where I'm at depending on the condition of the cigar if it's broadleaf sometimes I'll tend to do that if a cigar has been laying out for a little while and um, if I have to sometimes I'll even take a little bit of water and put it on the wrapper you know we're talking about cigars that haven't been kept properly if they've been kept properly there's no there's I, I don't see any reason to do it Dude, they, you can't put that freaking torch flame onto the tobacco, for the love of God. I see people in the industry do it to each his own, just through my experience. And, you know, if you're really trying to capture what's going on, that flame is almost 4,000 degrees, I believe. We're in the 3,000 to 4,000 degree mark. Soft flame, I think you're in the 800 range. You can't you can't put that fl that flame right onto the tobacco. That blue flame should never touch the tobacco. All you guys out there, try it. That you should be able to hold that flame. If you put your hand above that flame, I mean that thing can get powerful. Hold it back. Get an I I consume butane. Toast it up. Keep it going. Don't touch the don't put that blue flame on the tobacco. And then if you're puffing on it too much, that's gonna, you're increasing the heat and you're just, it can totally change the dynamics of the blend. We're out in Las Vegas for the trade show. Again, especially if you have heavier tobaccos. If you have heavier tobaccos and you smoke them drier, it's a whole different blend whole different blend it's going to be much harsher much more you know hit you much harder those dry leaves you've seen leaves that are dry you know and the light they you know so you get a combination of those things you know and then that can be turned into i don't like that cigar i don't like you know this or this isn't good and you know not that's not always the case retro hailing you know, definitely something that I suggest to people that eventually over time, if they don't do it, to experiment with and get to know. Because if you really want to get to know tobacco and take it to that next level of really getting more of these nuances, more of these flavors, you know, I'm usually taking in 75% and then retrohaling 25%. And when you see I'm doing it at a point, this is tough if you're just starting to do it, um, is doing it slowly. You know, it's not, when you first start doing those who can't do it, you know, right now it's because your, your, your old factory is not used to it. With time, you become used to it like many other things in this great life. And you start to pick up things slowly. Um, but I'm really taking my time with that last 25%. I'm really, it's, it's not just coming right out of my nose. It's, and I, you're starting to pick up because you're really, you know, I, I think you you have four to 5,000 flavor receptors on your palate. You're, you're registering five of the flavors. I think if you remember the sweet, salty, sour, bitter, savory, everything else is coming from the millions 
of receptors you have in your olfactory. I think that's how it's pronounced. I always say olfactory. It's olfactory. Am I saying this right? Do you know how to say this? Olfactory. My, la my English language is, I, I butcher it sometimes. Um, so, you know, millions of receptors there. So you're really, where is all these other flavors coming from? Chocolate, vanilla. So th th these flavors are all really coming from up here. You're registering the five down here, but the actual nuances of these flavors is if you lost your ability to smell, I don't think you could taste that much. We got Groucho, Mark Twain. I don't know. So these came from the, the shop that I used to work for called the Calabash Shop. These were in the shop. I started working the shop in August of 96. These were in the shop at that time. And I don't remember who did them. I, someone told me at one point that actually a cigar company back in the 80s had come out with them as like... I think promotional in the store. So I, I, I really, that might not be true. So I, I honestly don't know exactly where they come from, but they're really special to me because they, they come from the shop and um, you know, it's a great reminder for me of the shop. And then these two amazing uh, cigar store Indians, my father had found at a cigar shop somewhere that was going, I think out of business uh, some years ago and they don't even know you know exactly where they came from but i just always love the colors you know red gold and green and got those 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 rasta colors on there so you know i love those so and then i have my actually first humidor that my father and my mother gave me for my graduation from high school diamond crowned humidor so yeah that's been that's been everywhere nicaragua now here so yeah, and then, uh, yeah, I got some nice M audio speakers back there. <laughs> you know, the whole office is just kind of, um, you know, this was really my, uh, my home office, you know, so all the stuff in here was actually in my house and I just kind of, you know, decorated, still have a lot of stuff. I have my grandfather's pipe collection still in storage, so I have like, 50 years worth of his pipe collection. Yeah. Let me see, I have some pipe, you know, a lot of pipe, uh, part of my pipe collection is here. So, um, I've actually been smoking the pipe a lot lately. Hmm. Yeah. Actually, I have to give all the credit to Massimo. So Massimo Musico, um, creator of pipes called Becker and Musico. It's one of the oldest shops in Rome. I used to live in Rome before I uh, li lived in Nicaragua, moved to Nicaragua. And uh, I walked into this shop by the Trevi Fountain one day and I actually had uh, a Selassie shirt on. So the same as that image that's on the Tabernacle box, I had a similar one on a shirt. And I walked into this pipe shop and it was Beautiful, like really like high-end briar pipes, canes, you know, chess sets, like beautiful glass, like really, really like nice, nice. So I walk in, you know, I'm in a t-shirt and, uh, you know, walk in off the street. There was no sign on the door. So the guy comes out behind the counter and he goes, Rastaman, what's going on? He saw my shirt. I said, hey, you know, what's going on, man? What's going on? He's, he was like, yeah, this is a great pipe shop. And I said, I used to work at a tobacco shop and sell pipes. He said, oh yeah, what, what pipes did you sell? I said, Peterson, I sell some Sabinelli's, Becker and Musico. He goes, well, well, I am Massimo Musico. I go, what? <laughs> I am Massimo Musico. I didn't see the sign on the door, but it was Becker and Musico. So I had been selling his pipes like, the whole year prior, didn't even know it. They don't even export to the States anymore. That was just like the end of the 90s, early 2000s. They were exporting, but they only stay to the local market. You can't even find them. So anyway, when I was thinking about names to come up for a cigar company, um, Massimo was very much into reggae. 
So we became close friends. You know, I was there in the shop every day. The big touristy site, you know, Trevi Fountain is right there, where all the locals would go to this pipe shop and hang out. So they had a little, you know, sofa. They made their own blend that was un unbelievable. Politicians, you know, businessmen. So this is where I hung out every day. And uh, his father, Giorgio, is like the yogi of pipes and a yogi. You would never think like practices yoga every morning, but you never, you know, beard, really well cut, you know, collared shirt. And this guy was like, I would just learn every day I was in there. So fast forward to five years ago, Massimo ended up developing a collective of boutique pipe makers in Rome of his close friends that were handcrafted pipe makers that were just Roman pipe makers. And he made a collective called Foundation by Massimo Musico. When I was starting the company, I called him up. I called him up. Foundation is a word that is always, especially amongst reggae music, and it's a very powerful word because everything starts with a strong foundation, right? Music, everything that you do in life. So I called him Massimo. I said, Massimo, I said, I'm starting a cigar company. I said, you, you don't have this registered in the States. I said, I would love to use the name if you, if you don't want me to use it, no problem. I just want to register it too, so you have it. I have other, you know, I'm working through. Nicholas, I am the pipe maker. You are the cigar maker. It would be my honor for you to use foundation cigars. So I got his blessing and uh, that was it. That's the, that's the real deal story. That's how it started. So it's a special name because uh, Massimo is like one of those people, just a craftsman, you know. He said he, he doesn't have a website. Where, my website is the store. This is my website. You know, he's uh, a whole other level of craftsman. So. It's recording right now. No big deal. Where no. am I looking, you or the camera or both? I I, I don't know. I wouldn't worry about it. This All is right. only going to be like 10 seconds. Okay. One more, one more, one more, one more. One more. One more. All right. What are we saying? What, whatever you want. Whatever what you is want. It you've been saying? I've been saying nothing. We've been doing weird things. <laughs> <laughs> hey, folks. I'm Dave with Small Batch Cigars Daily Batch. And today I'm talking to Nicholas Malio, Foundation Cigar Company. What's up? Foundation. Here in the heart of the Connecticut River Valley. It's a pleasure to have you. No. Uh, pleasure's mine. I say something. <laughs> <laughs> He's gonna be talking to us in the tobacco barns and in his office for some Q and A. Great to have you here, Dave. I didn't see your hand until the end there. That's good, man. That was good. We'll see you soon. That's it. All right, that was good.